All right. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, today we are on chapter five, healing and wholeness. And I am going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, healing and wholeness introduction. To heal is to make happy. I have told you to think how many opportunities you have had to gladden yourself and how many you have refused. This is the same as telling you that you have refused to heal yourself. The light that belongs to you is the light of joy. Radiance is not associated with sorrow. Joy calls forth an integrated willingness to share it and promotes the mind's natural impulse to respond as one. Those who attempt to heal without being wholly joyous themselves call forth different kinds of responses at the same time and thus deprive others of the joy of responding wholeheartedly. To be wholehearted, you must be happy. If fear and love cannot exist, and if it is impossible to be wholly fearful and remain alive, the only possible whole state is that of love. There is no difference between love and joy. Therefore, the only possible whole state is the wholly joyous. To heal or to make joyous is therefore the same as to integrate and to make one. That is why it makes no difference to what part or by what part of the sonship the healing is offered. Every part benefits and benefits equally. You are being blessed by every beneficent thought of any of your brothers anywhere. You should want to bless them in return out of gratitude. You need not know them individually or they you. The light is so strong that it radiates throughout the sonship and returns thanks to the Father for radiating his joy upon it. Only God's holy children are worthy channels of his beautiful joy because only they are beautiful enough to hold it by sharing it. It is impossible for a child of God to love his neighbor except as himself. That is why the healer's prayer is, let me know this brother as I know myself. I love that. You know, it's interesting. I'm in, I'm part of a couple of different Course in Miracles study groups and oh, some of them I start reading and oh, wow, they're, they seem to just take any opportunity to judge or make a point of saying something about somebody for their opinion or their, you know, it's not, it's not Course in Miracles enough. It's not, you know, whatever. And um, there was one group I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure if I can stay in this group anymore because every time I would read it, I would just get this feeling of ugh inside of myself, right? I would read it and I'd just be like, this is a Course in Miracles group on Facebook. And they're like at each other's throats. I'm like, I don't understand, you know, what is happening? You know, and I think the the idea is that, oh, you know, it's all Course in Miracles and don't take it personally and don't do this. And you got to understand it's non-judgment. And I'm like, yeah, but they're just not being nice. They're not being wholly joyous. You know? <laughs> so I guess, I guess it, that is a judgment. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think there's a part of, of your nature that just wants when, when you're at that place of joy, you know, you just want to share it and you just don't want to participate in the drama anymore. You're just done with it. You're like, I don't need to read about this. I don't need to look at it. It's, it's no longer something that interests me in getting involved in it. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I've seen that happen a lot. And uh, there's a Facebook course in miracles page that, um, 
And I, I've experienced the same thing. And I, I don't comment on anything that I see, but sometimes somebody will put out an intriguing question. And I'm like, oh, I love it. I wonder, I wonder what the responses are. So you start oh. scrolling through and I'm like, same reaction. You people are studying Course in Miracles. This all sounds like just judgy nonsense to me. And people telling other people what they should think or what they should feel or how this is interpreted. And I've also seen in those same comments, people saying, why are you judging us or whatever? I'm out of this group. There's a lot of people that right. get to say, ah, peace out, but I'm not listening to this anymore. So it, yeah. absolutely, that happened. But it's funny because the first couple of lines of this spoke to what I was just talking about is getting to the place where you're not just talking the talk, but you're walking the walk. And it says... Um, to heal is to make happy. Uh, I have told you, I've told you to think how many opportunities you have had to gladden yourself and how many you have refused. That's, you know, that's in looking back over my shoulder 12 years ago, you know, my same wish list. Um, yeah. How many opportunities have I refused? Said so this is the same as telling you that you have refused to heal yourself. Ding, 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 ding. The light that belongs to you is the light of joy. And so anyway, that that really spoke to me is to my comment right before we started. Yeah, I love that. I wanna say hello to Julia who joined while we were reading and to Cynthia. Hi guys, great to have you here. Uh, anybody else have any other comments about that introduction? A couple of things. Um, First of all, like the first, second, second sentence of paragraph two, where it says, if fear and love cannot coexist, yeah, we're down with that. And if it is impossible to be wholly fearful and remain alive, right, okay, it's, it's one of those bits where the course does this kind of logical sequence and to prove a point, and you're like, hang on a minute. <laughs> um, if it is impossible to be wholly fearful and remain alive, we are a little bit curious about that. Um, we don't know that it's true or not true. It just seems to be a strange thing to claim. Like, so we just wondered if anybody had got anything that they could help to um, demystify that for us. That's actually a good question. Um, and it almost sounds like they're speaking kind of about the illusion, right? In a way, because it's impossible to be wholly fearful and remain alive. Okay, but what is alive really, right? So does that mean alive as in spirit, right? Because it can't mean alive in the body because we all know that when we're in the body, we're alive, right? But that's an illusion according to A Course in Miracles. But maybe what it's saying is wholly fearful, like, it's impossible to remain within the body and be wholly fearful. But I don't know what that means because I don't know that I've ever been wholly fearful in the body. So that's a good question. Yeah, thank you we, for sharing. We kind of feel like we get the gist of it, but we're just, a, yeah, just a bit curious. And the other, the other thing, similarly, it says only God's holy children are worthy channels of his beautiful joy because only they are beautiful enough to hold it by sharing it. Um, and that for us begs the question, well, who is, is there such a thing as somebody or something that is not worthy, a worthy channel? Like, only God's holy children. You know, we've heard that kind of phrase used a lot to distinguish the righteous from the unrighteous, you know, and we, we know that the course doesn't do that and quite rightly. Um, so it's like, it feels like saying, oh, you should only breathe the air in the room. It's like, oh, what else am I going to breathe? So a little <laughs> bit, a little bit, um, we don't, we don't need a discussion. We just wanted to air it with perhaps the idea that we would I don't know it just seems another again a strange way of of saying something um yeah I'm with you on that it does seem a bit strange and and again I think there's so much of this course especially for me I I had a, a really hard time with all of these religious contexts you know the holy spirit and god and 
all of it, I, I was just like, ugh, I'm not even interested in any of this. Um, that I think that I've just become so used to in my mind saying, okay, words are symbols of symbols. So what does this, what is this really saying? Like, well, everyone in truth is part of the one mind of God. So we must all be holy children because we're all part of the one mind of God and there is no separation. So there's, there's no distinction between any of us, you know? So, but to your point, then why even say it, right? Why even say it and make it seem like it's, it's a special thing for special people who are holier than thou, right? Go ahead, Sonny. You have a question? No, um, but a comment. Um, yeah, we would say that any extension of God is a child of God. And, um, and yet we are on chapter five and not everyone knows that yet. And so perhaps that's why it's worded the way that it is. Oh, right. Because it's still in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point, Sonny. I, I love the first sentence in paragraph three. You are being blessed by every beneficent thought of any of your brothers anywhere. What a wonderful feeling comes with that. Like, there's a lot of holiness, a lot of blessing coming my way from people all over the world. And just to be able to take that in, I just love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, a wonderful thought. And, and and that too, for me, is one of those words that I get like, Ugh, you know, you are blessed. You know, it's like, what does that mean? I don't like that word. I, it's it's like, it's a weird word for me, right? It's like, I always think of, you know, oh, God bless you. It's like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, I've, I've heard that growing up, like, oh, God bless you, which really means you poor little thing. You are so pathetic. You know, <laughs> It's like, so I guess to me, like that word, you are blessed, always you know, I have to remember, okay, words are symbols of symbols. And I know I am, you know, a blessed child of God, whatever that means, you know, I'm loved. Okay. Or I am love is, is for me a better way of saying that, but I've always had a problem with that word too, you know, and I guess it goes back to our early conditioning. You know, I wasn't brought up in a religious family I wasn't brought up in any type of religion and when I did experience it it was always I was always kind of looked at like this poor little thing that needed God's help you know because I just wasn't quite enough and so I don't know right I just um those words are just interesting <laughs> for me <Bitter. laughs> we, we, we go to um we go to church on a Sunday morning online sometimes not always we're not we're not we don't consider ourselves a Christian but we do go to church because we enjoy it um yeah and there's a bit where where there's like con the congregation gets to offer ask for prayers for things like we want to pray for our mother who's in hospital you know and ev and everybody says God in your grace hear our prayer and it that it, it really doesn't work for us at all, that whole idea of like, oh, by the way, God, in case you haven't noticed, this woman over here really needs some help. It, it's, um, it's just odd for us. Um, yeah. Although, you know, we're not saying that we don't sometimes feel moved to prayer, but, uh, and we've heard wonderful stories as well about what happens when when people pray. Sure. But, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I guess for me, it's more like, I feel that in a state of, when I'm in a state of oneness or meditation, right? When I'm actually quieting my mind and connecting to source energy, to love, to God, whatever that, you know, whatever that one mind of God is, right? So I felt that in those moments, for sure. Um, yeah, I suppose when we're doing that, we are we are allowing ourselves to sort of experience that love for other people, aren't we? In that moment when we're saying that we are 
we're opening our hearts and we are, um, yeah. Yeah, but I think as soon as we look at other people as less than, we yeah. lose it, like, or in need of, right? We we have to really hold that image of them as perfect and, and whole and complete and not like, oh, the poor thing, the poor thing needs help. The poor thing needs a prayer. It's like, that's, I think, where the separation just goes, won't you know, and, and we need to bring it back to, no, it's not the poor thing that it is a child of God and complete and whole. And we, as we all are, and how do we maintain that? Right. How do we maintain that joy? Right. Which we were just reading about to heal is to make happy, to just share that joy that we have in our heart. Right. Because until we are completely joyous, we can't, share the joy we can't share the love um so yeah it's um it's an interesting it's an interesting concept and and practice to be able to be in that place of joy and love and then when you're in that place of joy and love then you just want to share it with everybody all the time to that point and what you said in the beginning as well which is the same thing but um joy calls forth an integrated willingness to share it and um anyway as we were reading this and you were uh speaking about it we're reminded of a uh, um a book with the search or the tracker um it's a two-part thing uh, by a fellow named tom brown jr but in it he talked about his um a lot was around his relationship with his best friend and their tutelage under their grandfather but um the two friends got into a fight they were young um but it was the only fight they had in their whole life and they stopped talking to each other and they were really into the wilderness and like that and you know um grandpa was a apache medicine man who was teaching them the ways kind of thing so they were just immersed in that hadn't talked to each other like that for for days and um and then one of them saw a uh, a bird's egg that was just about to hatch and it was like oh screw this i gotta go get my friend we have to share this with somebody right and he ran to find him and they passed each other around the bend because his friend was running to see catch him because he found some turtle eggs that were about and he just had to share it because his joy was so big that it was like they put everything into perspective they needed each other and the fight was yeah. silly even at nine they figured that out so you know yay <laughs> that's awesome thank you for sharing that so that film into the wild i don't know if anybody's seen that film into the wild about a young man who goes off in alaska is it or somewhere on his own and yeah and he's writing a diary and at the end of it he kind of just as he's going to die he sort of says there's no point in any of this with nobody to share it with um yeah 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 that was a very sad ending boy <laughs> but yeah but that to your point yeah it, it is sharing right and we always say you can't go without your brother. And and there's there's the point right there to share the joy. All right. Any other conversations before we continue? All right, let's go. <clears throat> the invitation to the Holy Spirit. Healing is a thought by which two minds perceive their oneness and become glad. This gladness calls to every part of the sonship to rejoice with them and lets God go out into them and through them. Only the healed mind can experience revelation with lasting effect because revelation is an experience of pure joy. If you do not choose to be wholly joyous, your mind cannot have what it does not choose to be. Remember that spirit, spirit knows no difference between having and being. The higher mind thinks according to the laws spirit obeys and therefore honors only the laws of God. To spirit, getting is meaningless and giving is all. Having everything 
spirit holds everything by giving it and thus creates as the father created. While this kind of thinking is totally alien to having things, even to the lower mind, it is quite comprehensible in connection with ideas. If you share a physical possession, you do divide its ownership. If you share an idea, however, you do not lessen it. All of it is still yours, although all of it has been given away. Further, if the one to whom you give it accepts it as his, he reinforces it in your mind and thus increases it. If you can accept the concept that the world is one of ideas, the whole belief and the false association the ego makes between giving and losing is gone. Let us start our process of reawakening with just a few simple concepts. Thoughts increase by being given away. The more who believe in them, the stronger they become. Everything is an idea. How then can giving and losing be associated? This is the invitation to the Holy Spirit. I have said already that I can reach up and bring the Holy Spirit down to you, but I can bring him to you only at your own invitation. The Holy Spirit is in your right mind as he was in mine. The Bible says, may the mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus and uses this as a blessing. It is the blessing of miracle mindedness. It asks that you may think as I thought, joining with me in Christ thinking. The Holy Spirit is the only part of the Holy Trinity that has a symbolic function. He is referred to as the healer, the comforter, and the guide. He is also described as something separate, apart from the Father and from the Son. I myself said, if I go, I will send you another comforter and he will abide with you. His symbolic function makes the Holy Spirit difficult to understand because symbolism is open to different interpretations. As a man and also one of God's creations, my right thinking, which came from the Holy Spirit or the universal inspiration, taught me first and foremost that this inspiration is for all. I could not have it myself without knowing this. The word no is proper in this context because the Holy Spirit is so close to knowledge that he calls it forth or better allows it to come. I have spoken before of the higher or true perception, which is so near to truth that God himself can flow across the little gap. Knowledge is always ready to flow everywhere, but it cannot oppose. Therefore, you can obstruct it, although you can never lose it. The Holy Spirit is the Christ mind, which is aware of the knowledge that lies beyond perception. He came into being with the separation as a projection, I'm sorry, as a protection, inspiring the at one principle at the same time. Before that, there was no need for healing, for no one was comfortless. The voice of the Holy Spirit is the call to at one minute, or the restoration of the integrity of the mind. When the at one minute is complete and the whole sonship is healed, there will be no call to return. But what God creates is eternal. The Holy Spirit will remain with the sons of God 
to bless their creations and keep them in the light of joy. God honored even the miscreations of his children because they had made them. But he also blessed his children with a way of thinking that could raise their perceptions so high they could reach almost back to him. The Holy Spirit is the mind of the at one mint. He represents a state of mind close enough to one-mindedness that transfer to it is at last possible. Perception is not knowledge, but it can be transferred to knowledge or cross over into it. It might be even it might even be more helpful here to use the literal meaning of transferred or carried over since the last step is taken by God. The Holy Spirit, the shared inspiration of all the sonship, induces a kind of perception in which many elements are like those in the kingdom of heaven itself. First, its universality is perfectly clear, and no one who attains it could believe for one instant that sharing it involves anything but gain. Second, it is incapable of attack and is therefore truly open. This means that although it does not engender knowledge, it does not obstruct it in any way. Finally, it points the way beyond the healing that it brings and leads the mind beyond its own integration toward the paths of creation. It is at this point that sufficient quantitative change occurs to produce a real qualitative shift. Well, that was kind of a lot. Mm -hmm. That's what I just said to Carl, that whole last paragraph, I'd have to go back and read a couple of times because it, as you were reading it, it, I was hearing wah, 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 wah. wah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you were Charlie Brown's teacher momentarily. No, I get it. I get it. You know, every time I read it too, I feel like a little bit more gets in. I've been doing this for 31 years. Yeah, I find it interesting sometimes how some of these earlier chapters can actually feel like the least integrated into our understanding our personal understanding yeah whereas the later chapters it's like yeah yeah I got this um but th yeah this one no I we had the same experiences um Alicia that uh yeah, like, yeah these words, we understand the words but that's about as far as we're going with that um there was one bit we liked um 410 knowledge is always ready to flow everywhere but it cannot oppose we liked that quite a lot. We've noticed in the lessons that we've been doing recently, you know, in a, a lot of the lessons, it says, like, repeat the idea for today and then allow related thoughts to come. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've we've recently had that, it, had the experience of, like, okay, no related thoughts are coming, so we're just going to stop thinking. Um, and And then... Yeah, as we stop thinking, the thoughts will just appear in the back in there in our mind. There's just like, oh, okay. There's just like suddenly this flow starts to come. Um and that's it, isn't it? Yeah. It's it it the, well, the, the image that it gives us is of of like truth or knowledge, like just kind of waiting there for you to shut up long enough for it to make itself heard. Um yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's that's on point because you can't even get there until the, the thoughts stop. Mm. And then it, it's the paradox, right? It's the paradox of it. You just, to heal, you have to just be in that place of at one minute and open to the thoughts. Mm. Yeah. It's like meditation, you know, you just let the thoughts go, let it flow through. Exactly, exactly. By Michael Singer, um, The Untethered Soul. And I liked mm. his description where um, <clears throat> you kind of step back from this train of thoughts going by and you become the observer. 
So you're not resisting, you're not pushing them away. You're not, you're just kind of watching them go along. Like the train just keeps moving along. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that analogy. Yeah. I never read that book. I had an, uh, I used to do an in-person course in miracles group. And there was a man there who, who adored that book and would try to push it on anybody who, who, who came, but um, we don't, we're not a big reader of books. We've read very little apart from this book. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Some years now. Oh, we've covered our book, by the way, in case. <laughs> you That's beautiful. It is. Yeah, that Um Yeah, so uh, but what will we say? Oh yeah, The Untethered Star Soul. Maybe we should give it a try. We probably <laughs> won't. <laughs> um, but it's, it, yeah, yeah. Any other discussions before we continue? I was looking at the very last sentence. It is at this point that sufficient quantitative change occurs to produce a real qualitative shift. And I was thinking about what that could possibly mean. And I was thinking maybe enough introspection has happened in my life that Things have dropped away that weren't helpful. And maybe enough of those things have dropped away. That's the, the quantitative, the quantity of the stuff that is, I realize is no longer helpful. I've let them go. And then a more to allow for the qualitative shift that can happen as a result of that. I'm not yeah. sure. I mean, for me, I feel like I was sharing something early on with a few people who had joined early. Um, I was listening to this Mark Groves podcast this morning and he's all about relationships and, you know, he, he gets into like the human connection and what is it all about? And he was interviewing this, this man who's not a young man anymore. Who's um, I can't even remember his last name, but um, if anybody wants me to share it, I'm happy to share it with them. But this particular person was talking about a dream he had when he was five years old and he was abused when he was little. And he was had this dream when he was five. It was and it was a lucid dream. And he knew it was a lucid dream. He knew he was dreaming and he was being chased by this scary monster. And he turned around and he shrunk the monster. And for whatever reason, he decided at that moment to pick up the monster and, and to hug him and to hold him and to just love him. Right. And then he said he woke up and in his dream, the, the monster had represented his father who was horribly abusive, like so bad that he was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences in prison for the horrible things he had done to this child. But he, the, this young man, I don't know if he's young, I don't know how old he is right now. Um, but in this interview, he said, um, he said that, he knew when he woke up that the monster had been represented representative of his father. And in the dream, something changed on a quantitative shift to produce a, a quantitative change to produce a qualitative shift. And the relationship completely changed, completely changed. The father was no longer abusive the powers that be came and arrested him. And this, this young man now was put into foster care. He's had a lovely experience after that point, but that just goes to show you that this is a dream that we're having right now. And within this dream, we have the other dreams, right? Which, which can be, which can be dreams that can help us produce these changes because we have these moments of experiences, right? And we already said, we already read earlier that everything is thoughts. Everything is thoughts. We think it and then we have it. Like I thought about having this warm cup of lemon water and now I have it in my hand. But it first started with a thought, right? And now here it is. You know, I can feel it. I can taste it. I can drink it. But before that could happen, it had to start with a thought, right? Right. Same way in our dream states, he thought about this monster, he shrunk it, and then he hugged it, right? It's like he had the forgiving dream within this dream state. And then when he woke up within the dream, again, of course, everything changed. 
right? It all starts with thoughts, which I think is so interesting when you kind of put it in terms of what we're reading here in A Course in Miracles, you know, it's the experience like, okay, so I can change my dreams and then my life changes. Yeah, that's how it works. And even though this is part of the illusion, right? I think the whole point is to just be in this place of finally be being able to heal and being wholly joyous, which we read in the beginning, so that we can share that joy with our brothers. Like Sonny was talking about, you know, they would just want to share the joy with each other. We just want to share the joy with our brothers, right? But before we can do that, we have to heal the trauma, the all of the stuff, right? That's in the illusion. All right. Any other thoughts before we keep going? All right. Let's keep going. And we are in to the voice for God. Healing is not creating. It is reparation. The Holy Spirit promotes healing by looking beyond it to what the children of God were before healing was needed and will be when they have been healed. This alteration of time sequence should be quite familiar because it is very similar to the shift in the perception of time that the miracle introdu introduces. The Holy Spirit is the motivation for miracle mindedness. The decision to heal the separation by letting it go. Your will is still in you because God placed it in your mind. And although you can keep it asleep, you cannot obliterate it. God himself keeps your will alive by transmitting it from his mind to yours, as long as there is time. The miracle itself is a reflection of this union of will between father and son. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. He is the call to return with which God blessed the minds of his separated sons. This is the vocation of the mind. The mind had no calling until the separation because before that it had only being and would not have understood the call to right thinking. The Holy Spirit is God's answer to the separation, the means by which the at one -ment heals until the whole mind returns to creating. The principle of at one -ment and the separation began at the same time. When the ego was made, God placed in the mind the call to joy. This call is so strong that the ego always dissolves at its sound. That is why you must choose to hear one of two voices within you. One you made yourself, and that one is not of God. But the other is given you by God, who asks you only to listen to it. The Holy Spirit is in you in a very literal sense. His is the voice that calls you back to where you were before and will be again. It is possible even in this world to hear only that voice and no other. It takes effort and great willingness to learn. It is the final lesson that I learned. And God's sons are as equal as learners as they are as sons. You are the kingdom of heaven, but you have let the belief in darkness enter your mind, and so you need a new light. The Holy Spirit is the radiance that you must let banish the idea of darkness. His is the glory before which dissociation falls away, and the kingdom of heaven breaks through into its own. Before the separation, you did not need guidance. You knew as you will know again, but as you do not know now. God does not guide because he can share only perfect knowledge. Guidance is 
evaluative because it implies there's a right way and also a wrong way, one to be chosen and the other to be avoided. By choosing one, you give up the other. The choice for the Holy Spirit is a choice for God. God is not in you in a literal sense. You are part of him. When you chose to leave him, he gave you a voice to speak for him because he could no longer share his knowledge with you without hindrance. Direct communication was broken because you had made another voice. The Holy Spirit calls you both to remember and to forget. You have chosen to be in a state of opposition in which opposites are possible. As a result, there are choices you must make. In the holy state, the will is free so that its creative power is unlimited and choice is meaningless. Freedom to choose is the same power as freedom to create, but its application is different. Choosing depends on a split mind. The Holy Spirit is one way of choosing. God did not leave his son, his children comfortless, even though they chose to leave him. The voice they put in their minds was not the voice for his will, for which the Holy Spirit speaks. The voice of the Holy Spirit does not command because it is incapable of arrogance. It does not demand because it does not seek control. It does not overcome because it does not attack. It merely reminds. It is compelling only because of what it reminds you of. It brings to your mind the other way, remaining quiet even in the midst of turmoil you may make. The voice for God is always quiet because it speaks of peace. Peace is stronger than war because it heals. War is division, not increase. No one gains from strife. What profiteth if it a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you listen to the wrong voice, you have lost sight of your soul. You cannot lose it, but you can not know it. It is therefore lost to you until you choose right. The Holy Spirit is your guide in choosing. He is in the part of your mind that always speaks for the right choice because he speaks for God. He is your remaining communication with God, which you can interrupt but cannot destroy. The Holy Spirit is the way in which God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Both heaven and earth are in you because the call of both is in your mind. The voice for God comes from your own altars to him. These altars are not things. They are devotions. Yet you have other devotions now. Your divided devotion has given you the two voices and you must choose at which altar you want to serve. The call you answer now is an evaluation because it is a decision. The decision is very simple. It is made on the basis of which call is worth more to you. My mind will always be like yours because we were created as equals. It was only my decision that gave me all power in heaven and earth. My only gift to you is to help you make the same decision. This decision is the choice to share it because the decision itself is the decision to share. It is made by giving and is therefore the one choice that resembles true creation. I am your model for decision. By deciding for God, I showed you that this decision can be made and that you can make it. I have assured you that the mind that decided for me is also in you and that you can let it change you 
just as it changed me. This mind is unequivocal because it hears only one voice and answers in only one way. You are the light of the world with me. Rest does not come from sleeping, but from waking. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is the call to awaken and be glad. The world is very tired because it is the idea of weariness. Our task is the joyous one of waking it to the call for God. Everyone will answer the call of the Holy Spirit or the sonship cannot be as one. What better vocation could there be for any part of the kingdom than to restore it to the perfect integration that can make it whole? Hear only this through the Holy Spirit within you and teach your brothers to listen as I am teaching you. When you're tempted by the wrong voice, call on me to remind you how to heal by sharing my decision and making it stronger. As we share this goal, we increase its power to attract the whole sonship and to bring it back into the oneness in which it was created. Remember that yoke means join together and burden means message. Let us restate my yoke is easy and my burden light in this way. Let us join together for my message is light. I have enjoined you to behave as I behaved, but we must respond to the same mind to do this. This mind is the Holy Spirit, whose will is for God always. He teaches you how to keep me as the model for your thought and to behave like me as a result. The power of our joint motivation is beyond belief, but not beyond accomplishment. What we can accomplish together has no limits because the call for God is the call to the unlimited. Child of God, my message is for you to hear and give away as you answer the Holy Spirit within you. Again, a lot, a lot, a lot. We put Kuzume to sleep. <laughs> We do have trouble concentrating for a whole hour. Um, I have trouble concentrating, even up, even though I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like lots of bits of this. I mean, it is a lot of words, but it feels, at least right now, it feels like a fairly straightforward message, kind of. That, yeah, the Holy Spirit's in our mind and we should listen to that voice. Um, we liked, God is not in you in a literal sense, you're part of him. Um, yeah, so many people talk about God as if it's something separate. Um, and yeah, that was something we realized years and years ago that there's nothing else, there's nothing that isn't God, there's nothing outside of God. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah we love the yeah paragraph seven um the voice for god is always quiet because it speaks of peace peace is stronger than war because it heals and also it says either here or elsewhere you know that the voice for truth doesn't need to shout because it's true <laughs> that's its strength its strength lies in its in its truth not in its um volume or its um insistence or anything else it's just like yeah you know nothing can be nothing can yeah nothing can stand against what is real and what is true um for long anyway um maybe a few million millennia but <laughs> no longer than that um the other thing that sorry just to go on but we'll just get it all out the other thing that struck us was 
uh, paragraph eight, the middle of paragraph eight, the voice of God comes from your own altars to him. These altars are not things, they are devotions, yet you have other devotions now. And at that point, we were like, oh, what other devotions? And, and we kind of just had a, a sort of vision of all of the things that we're devoted to in life, you know, all of the pursuits and the the whatever, the fame and the money and the <laughs> acclaim and the um, possessions and the experiences and 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 it was it was lovely because in that moment where we saw all those other devotions we also saw how completely empty they all were um compared to to what this course is um is telling us we should be devoted to which is um real and eternal and all that all that as as opposed to these sort of temporary ideas that we have of relief from the pain of life um in this kind of sorry sorry sort of plan that we have before we realize that there's something there's another way of just managing to alleviate um yeah all that we, we'll stop talking thank you for listening no i appreciate that that was a wonderful summary of a lot of what we just read so i i do appreciate you you doing that cuz that's very helpful and and i like the part where you said you know when when you're reading your, your mind has other devotions and i think that happens to a lot of us right we're reading the course and all of a sudden something like that oh what other devotions and our mind is like and all of a sudden like two paragraphs have got have gone by and we're like wait what did we just read I, I wasn't even paying attention because my mind was like on all these other things and all of these other places. So I think that's another thing that happens when we read The Course in Miracles, right? Because we're like, all of a sudden our mind is like, Every take something and it's gone. Every single time. Oh, look, a bunny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Squirrel. Yeah, it's true. It happens every time. Yeah, and I think that's also why you know, I, I say sometimes I don't underline anything in my books anymore. I, I've underlined so many things and I've even made notes and people's names. Oh, this is so-and-so or this is so-and-so, you know, and I, and I'll go through, I'm like, the next time I read it, I'm like, why did I underline that? What, what did I put that person's name for this? I don't understand this at all. Right. And I feel like as we go through it and we heal, right. Parts of the separation within our mind those things don't apply anymore because okay we've addressed that now there's something else though that maybe our mind was chasing the bunny and we didn't even know it existed and we're like I don't remember reading this before <laughs> you know because our mind was like pew it was gone it was in the field right or maybe it, maybe there are some parts that, yeah, are just wow, 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 the first time or the first 10 times we read them. And then suddenly we'll be like, oh, what are you saying? Um, yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Uh, any other exactly comments? It's, supposed to be. it's exactly the way it's supposed to be. The, the stuff that you uh, didn't hear. When you hear it next time, then it'll be something that you need to hear then. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I really enjoyed this reading. And I, especially the beginning where it just said, your mind is wholly joyous. You know, I'm just like, yes, I love that, you know, because I, I love that feeling of joy. And, and to me, like, it, you know, sometimes I question myself. It's like, so when my mind is wholly joyous and I'm feeling completely at one, you know, I, I like, I, I, sometimes I question myself, like, so it, am I not supposed to be experiencing any emotions because this is all an illusion? And I'm like, no, joy is part of that feeling of at one minute. And it's, it's, you know, a wonderful reminder to, to know that, you know, I guess we're on the right path right around that path of at one mint and um and it is that feeling of of joy yeah i love that i want to remind everyone again i know we've got five more minutes to discuss but um i will not be facilitating a course in miracles next week uh which is the 23rd october 23rd 
but I will be back on the 30th. Um, and as always, I am available uh, if anybody wants to talk or if they want to send me an email or a text message or, you know, however they want to get in touch with me. I also post in my Facebook group, Living a Course in Miracles for Students and Teachers when I'm away to kind of remind people that I'm not here. So um, next week, I will not be facilitating, but I'll be back on the 30th. Anybody else have any comments or questions about any of our discussions today? No? Okay. Well, I guess we'll close a few minutes early. Thank you all for coming. Always a pleasure. And I thought we had some wonderful conversations. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate thank all you. of you. Thank you. Have a great Thanks, week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Good everyone. Thing. See you soon. All right. Bye. See you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.